The Word is a proud media partner of Latitude Festival 2012. For more information and to purchase tickets, go to www.latitudefestival.co.uk. You're listening to a podcast from The Word. We're joined in the pod by Chaz Hodges. It's a delight to have you here. We'll Thank supply you very the much, applause. Folks. It's a joy to be here. Um, it's got a very busy Jubilee weekend coming up with yeah. loads and loads of gigs. You might be playing in your local marketplace or your local pub. Uh, yeah, Watch I'm in Romford room. Market, I think, uh, Sunday, and uh, uh, there's so many. I, I don't I know I'm in. Um, it kicks off the Half Moon on Friday, tomorrow. Um, half Moon Putney. And then on from there, right up until Tuesday. Uh, so, yeah. I'm it's a, it's a mini royal tour. But, of course. OK. Well, look, Chaz, it's delightful to have you here. Yes, nice And what to I here. propose to do is to go right back to the beginning. Far and come away. Through your immensely illustrious and varied career and come right up to date. OK. All right, and where, the away. way we normally start on a world podcast is we ask, what music was in your house when you were growing up? Can you remember? Most definitely. It was uh, my mum playing the piano. Uh, she she brought us... Me, me dad died when uh, I was three. Uh, we lived in Kent and uh, we came back to London and uh, not very well off uh, to, to live with me uh, grandparents. And uh, me and mum virtually brought us up playing the piano. But it was just... Uh, the, that's why piano uh, and music is a big part of my life. Uh, and not only did it help to feed us as we were growing up, it was always when when the uh, anybody came round, they always had big smiles on their faces when the music was being played. So it. Uh, so, so was she a professional piano player? Where did she no, play? No, she learned to play when when she was a kid. I mean, actually, I found all this out after. Uh, she used to go out busking with my great grandfather when she was about five. Six says pull up outside a pub somewhere, and uh, had a little harmonium, and which we still had at the time, which my nan gave to the rag man, which I never forgave her for. But that's another story. <laughs> this little portable harmonium, and um, that's that was the start of her, her musical career. So we're talking about in the twenties and thirties. Yeah, I, I would say well, she was born in nineteen thirteen, so if she was oh, five, no. about nineteen twenty. Yeah, oh, really? you're dead right. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So then you come back. Was this during the war as a child? Um, we moved to Kent uh, in 1947. Uh, my dad, uh, he committed suicide, we never know, know why, uh, the day before my fourth birthday. Then we came back to North London, as I said, to live with me nan and granddad and my great-grandfather. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was a pretty... Uh, not a lot of money about, but uh, it was happy, a happy childhood. So this I mean, is Edmonton, Tottenham, yeah, around there? Yeah, right, North London, right. Edmonton, yeah. So there was no record player in the house? No, we had uh, uh, a wind-up gramophone a bit later on, um, but in the, uh, the very early days there was no record player, no. We had the old radio and a lot of those uh, used to have, you know, Housewife's Choice on and... Uh, Used to hear things like Fat Swallow and uh, or, or who was my mum's favourite piano player. That's when I first heard of him. But no, there was no uh, record player. It was just a piano and a harmonium. Or if a party was going, me, me our great grandfather used to play the penny whistle. My nan played the mouth organ. So there's plenty of music going on in <laughs> Sound like a Giles cartoon. Yeah, yeah he, he said right, yeah. <laughs> so what was the first time that you played an instrument? What, what did you first pick up? First time um, I ever played... Uh, well, my mum always wanted... I remember her saying, I'll, I'll start at the beginning, she she used to play down the, the pub at, at the uh, on the Edmonton Green and um, she dearly wanted there to be a musician in the family. My older brother wasn't interested at all. He was into football and fishing and well, and so was I I remember my mum coming home one uh, Saturday afternoon she'd been playing up the pub and uh, she said oh there's uh, a, a piano teacher and he was quite a well known piano teacher around North London who was a fan of hers he used to go in the pub and, and, and watch her and he said have you got any he knew she she, she you know she didn't have a husband uh, he said have you got any kids he said yeah he said, he said if you've got any kids he said I'll teach them piano for nothing and I remember her coming home excited, and I still feel slightly well, disappointed about my my reaction to this day. She said, "If someone's come in and wants to 
uh, is, is a great piano teacher and he said, if I've got any children, he'll teach them for nothing. He said, how about, why don't you go? I said, well, I don't want to learn the piano. <laughs> <laughs> I was in just interested at the time. I was like playing football out in the street, going fishing and anything else but playing the piano. But um, not long after, um, I mean, I remember her saying to me, Nan, oh, well, there's not going to be a musician in the family. And I, I still remember her saying, so it must have stuck there. I could hear her voice now. But not long after, uh, in the early, f in the mid-50s, I remember hearing a record... Uh, and this sound, who I thought was fantastic, turned out to be Lonnie Donegan. Found out he played the guitar. This, uh... I'll play the song that I heard it. Won't you bring a little boat, Sylvie? Won't you bring a little boat now? Won't you bring a little boat to Sylvie? You know it every little once in a while. Do you love me, Sylvie? Do you love me now? Do you love me, Sylvie? You know it every little once in a while. Won't you bring a little boat, Sylvie? Won't you bring a little boat? Fantastic. Of course, hugely influential, Lonnie Donegan. Yeah. The whole generation of British musicians. Really unusual sound, wasn't it? Because he was a you know, British guy doing yeah. black American blues. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we uh, never heard it before. It's brand new to every, every uh, budding young musician in, in England. Um, all these, uh, 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 all, all these black blues blokes we'd never heard of. No, but uh, you, so the, Lonnie brought them. It to was us. filtered through Lonnie, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. So did that make you keen on having a, playing a guitar? Most definitely. I mean, that sound. I must remember that. Well, that's a great sound. And uh, I said to me mum, "Have you heard that record, Lonnie Donegan?" And she got excited. She said, "What?" She, it, I said, "This guitar is fantastic." She said, "If I got hold of a guitar." somewhere would you learn to play i went yeah anyway um my uncle alf uh, who lived in acne um he had an old guitar that they had in the family years ago cut a long story short he done it up and uh, i went over there and got it and got the guitar a little old still got it actually a little old spanish guitar and um i started because yeah, i didn't didn't know anybody who played guitar. Well, this is, they were, this is the thing that people don't realise. They were so rare, weren't yeah, they, in those yeah. days? They were, I heard Tommy Steele on the radio not long ago saying the only time you ever saw a guitar was played by a cowboy in a that's film. That's right, that's right, yeah. Not I mean, by a musician. Yeah. <laughs> ne never never see one in, in real life, like exactly what you said. You see him on films and might see him on the telly now and again. Uh, but... Yeah, I'd got this guitar and had no idea how to tune it. And my mum tuned it to, to a straight chord, which... I mean, it's not tuned to a chord, it's right. tuned to, to whatever it is. But she tuned it to a, a straight chord, so you just played... Just barred it. And it yeah. Bar it over, yeah. yeah. And um, it sounded all right, and she was going... To, uh, but I remember this, then watching Lonnie on the telly, and watching his fingers doing that and that and that and that. <laughs> uh, and I thought, those shapes he's doing, that, that that's doesn't not, make any sense. Don't make sense at all. <laughs> and uh, it just so happened that over the road, I mean, skiffle groups were just about beginning to, to happen. And there was a, a bloke over the road who was about four or five years older than me that started a skiffle group. And uh, my mum said, Look, he said, he comes home from work about half past five. So wait, at, wait for him to come home and take the guitar and get him to tune it up. And exactly, I did that. I wait for him, see him come down the road, took it over to him. And I said, would you mind tuning my guitar for me? And, and of course, he tuned it up. Properly. Like that, and he played a couple of chords. I remember he played an E chord, and I thought, that sounds great. Took it back to me mum, and she, she went like that. She said, that don't sound very good. <laughs> I said, he well, spoiled it. Yeah. I said, that, that, that is the proper tune, and that's what he's done. So then um, I think I've got a, um, a book. No, he showed me a couple of chords, right? So I'd got a start, you know. And um, then I got a hold of a little banjo that I got from a jumble sound. And I started getting pretty good on it. Although my mum said, oh, that's great, that's great, that's great. I thought, oh, that's just my mum. Anyway, the weren't long after, around the sweet shop, they used to put little signs in the window, you know, whatever, something for sale. There was a sign in the window around the sweet shop. She came back, she said, they want a guitar player in that skiffle group. 
why don't you go for the audition? And I thought, how can I go for an audition in this Griffith Grammar? How old are you then? I was 13. Right, OK. If I ain't good enough, you know, I might be good enough to strum along with a couple of records, but... She said, you go. She said, you are good enough. You go. Anyway, I, uh, cut a long story short, I went. And they were, oh, they, they was over the moon with my playing. And I just floated back. Because you were better than they yeah, were, probably. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, so their lineup is classic skiffle, skiffle group. What are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, T-chest, yeah. T-chest, T-chest, T-chest bass. bass. Yeah. Washboard. Yep. Yeah, with their the thimbles yeah. On the <laughs> yeah. to make the sound on the washboard. Yeah, yeah. Good yeah, grief. Yeah. What were they called? The band uh, was called the Horseshoe Skiffle Group. Okay. Um, they always had to have that kind of Western type. Yeah, band, yeah, 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 yeah. So you played local gigs in Edmonton, Tottenham. Yeah, the sort first. Of things? Uh, I remember the f- one of the first gigs I did was um, in a hole over the top of a pub in Edmonton <clears throat> called the Britannia, <clears throat> and I had the most fantastic night of my life. People dancing and clapping and cheering, and me strumming all these uh, the skiffle songs. And at the end, someone come up and plonked a ten bob note in my hand. And I went, what's that for? They said, oh, it's for tonight's, you know, your tonight's Ten shillings. Show. Yeah. It's and a lot of I money. Just, it was then. <laughs> and I thought, I could not, I really couldn't believe it, that I could have the best night I've ever had in my whole life, and then someone paid me for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was my ambition from that day. I thought, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Well, you've achieved that, And I'm you? still doing okay. it now, yeah. So let's, let's move, so we're getting into, into the 60s now, and the sort of skiffles becoming the... Beat groups and yeah, yeah. At what point did you kind of plug in? Um, I joined a, uh, with. There used to be this uh, meeting place every Friday night uh, called the King's Head. It was a great. Different bands uh, and electric guitars would were, were becoming evident. Little amplifiers and all that. We were all experimenting because there wasn't a lot of good gear about in those days, and. Um, I used to borrow an electric guitar. It's taking me acoustic down, but this this one of the blokes had uh, one of the kids had two two electric guitars. I used to borrow one, and someone that had the idea of, of this was we'd heard about electric basses, but you would never seen one. hadn't seen them yet. No, <laughs> um, he said, "Why don't you try tuning your, your bass strings down?" Anyway, I started tuning the bass strings. It sounded quite good, and. Uh, then it wasn't long after I see an advert for a bass guitar in in the, I think it was the Revalley newspaper. <laughs> they used to come out. Do you remember that? Revalley was yeah, kind yeah. of glamour girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheering stories about the forces. That's it. Yeah, go on. <laughs> right. uh, Not they, that I'm that old, for it. Uh, <laughs> they could they, they, uh, buy a bass guitar. So I remember it was Bell Accordion, Surbiton, Surrey, and uh, 40, 40 guineas. I guineas, for, yeah, 40 that's, guineas, yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah, 40 guineas was like, anybody who don't know, is like 40 pounds plus 40 shillings. shillings. Yeah, so 42 quid. Yeah. Um, got it on the knock. I remember my granddad signed as... Got it on the knock means yeah. higher purchase. Yeah. Because the only way you could get a thing like yeah. that. Yeah. And I uh, got this... Um, funny enough, I got... When the dame, the, the base arrived, um, 90, since 1959... Uh, but my mate was in the, in the skiffle group, played electric guitar. I've just got a postcard from him today, actually. This really? very day, he lives in Italy now, he's coming over. And anyway, he said, oh, I was there when you got that bass. I've still got it, still use it, actually. But, uh, yeah, I got the bass, and I had a little amp that used to play indoors, right, and just play along the records, and it used to sound great. And it really was, I just put a record on, I mean, and they started buying a few Elvis records and a few Jerry Lee records. And I plugged the bass in, and it used to sound fantastic, you know, alongside the... You used to get crowds of kids standing outside my front door listening to it, you know. <laughs> and um, finally came the time we are going to do a gig. Took me little amp up to the King's Head, and it was quite a, a biggish hall in those days. Plugged it in, and it just sounded horrible. It just didn't... I, didn't really, I thought it was going to sound like it did in my front room. It, but didn't, it didn't fill uh, the room, didn't fill the bigger space. No, definitely not. <laughs> and... Um, I ended up buying, uh, there was, uh, I remember seeing Cliff Richard and the Shadows in Walthamstow, Granada, and Jet Harris had this great big bass amp that uh, Wallace in Soho Street made for him. And uh, he sold it on someone else, and uh, it was uh, uh, the, the Hunters, Dave Sampson and the Hunters. And then I found out it was for sale, this 
amp that I'd seen and I went and bought it. it was a, I mean, it took like three people to carry it, it really did. <laughs> but it didn't have to have a sound to it. Really? And that became, uh, that, that became the amp. And uh, right. I was a fully fledged bass player. Uh, the band was formed called the Stormers. Uh, we went to Butlins for, in 1960. You went to Butlins and Filey? Yeah. Yeah, that was great. That was absolutely fantastic. So was it like, you know, Ringo in That'll Be The Day? You know, we've all seen bands in, you know, in playing butlins in the late yeah. 50s and early 60s. Yeah, all it, the girls you could possibly... Yeah, most definitely, yeah. It was wish great. to be friendly with. It was, it was <laughs> absolute heaven. It was like, I just couldn't believe it. And on everything I do, I still do now, you think it's going to carry on for the rest of your life. I mean, I was there for three months. And... Uh, we was getting 20 quid a week each in 1960, which is a lot of money. Blooming good money, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, different girlfriend every week. You, you all cried when that one went home and then got to meet the coach when the new one came, turned up. <laughs> so it's like being a red coat, but with additional glamour, really. Yeah, I mean, in a rock and roll just, band. just playing, playing, playing the, the, the guitar. I mean, what, what more could you wish for? Right. So uh, you were starting to get into the professional. Well, that was professional. Yeah. So w- when did you first start making records? When we came back, uh, a couple of the boys uh, got hooked up with girls and one of them got married and the other one decided to get married and the the band began to sort of, like, fall apart. The odd gig here and there, uh, I was really fed up. Uh, I got a job and then didn't like that very much and uh, it didn't seem long after. I think it was about... The September or the October, so a couple of months after we got back from Butlins and the band was like crumbling. Virtually had split up. I got a knock on my front door and it was this chap who'd come down to see us at Butlins with a singer called Danny Rivers, who we'd done a couple of demo tapes with. And he said, look, he said, um, I've got a singer. And he said, I don't know if you've heard of Joe Meek, which I didn't. He said, he's an independent record producer. He said, up at Holloway Road. And I said, I've got this singer, Mike Berry, who he loves, but he don't like his band very much. He said, if I could get your band back together, would you come up and audition for Mike Berry's backing band? I went, yeah, you know, I'd, uh, I'll be there. So he got the rest of the band together and we went up and auditioned at Joe Meeks and uh, he absolutely loved it. This was about like the beginning of 1961. So he hadn't already. He hadn't had Telstar. He wasn't. No. He hadn't had the huge hits. Yet. No. He'd he had, starting to. Yeah. He'd had uh, uh, Angela Jones, Mike, uh, Michael Cox. That was a hit. Yeah. One or two semi. You know, sort of just just about reach. So you the were charts. getting in there at the in the early part of. Yeah. You know yeah. that now that whole Joe Meek. Holloway Road studio thing has been mythologised and films made about it. You were in the film. Yeah, you? yeah, yeah. You know, tell us, what was it like? It really was like the film. I mean, Nick Moran, who, who produced and, and directed it, I mean, he, he had, had a meeting with me. Uh, the people pointed, because I was up there from 1961 till about 65. Uh, we were uh, Joe's uh, house band, in the, house the band. Outlaws. So who else would be in that group? Uh, no, right, so th- this was the Outlaws, right? Yeah, origin- originally there was uh, me on the bass guitar, uh, Reggie Hawkins rhythm guitar, Billy Kyle lead guitar, Bobby Graham drums, who became uh, the massive session man in the 60s, Bobby was on everything. Um, great drummer. So that was the original Outlaws, and they sort of, um, then the guitar player left, or he got the sack, can't remember now. And we got in Richie Blackmore, <laughs> who was with Screaming Lord Such at the time. Uh, we'd seen him and we started earning a few bob, so we, we, we nicked Richie off of, uh, of Such. And uh, he became part of the, the house band. Uh, we recorded uh, things like uh, Just Like Eddie with Hines, was, uh, Richie was playing on that. But before that, we, um, the first, uh, one of my first recordings was uh, Johnny Remember Me. Uh, John, John Layton, Layton right? Yeah. Uh, that was, I think it was 61, I think that was. Might have been 62. Uh, but that was number one. Uh, well, I was 16 then. Uh, so you just got session money, presumably. Yeah. A few quid for doing the session. That yeah, was your lot. Seven pounds, something, seven pounds, which I thought was fantastic. That suited me down to the ground. Right, you know? right, right. I mean, and, pe- and you learned very quickly, presumably, of course, as yeah. a session man. You've got to pick it up really quick. Yeah, yeah. 
I've always been uh, I was pretty quick at picking up stuff. I mean, um, so I could hear from from music that I inherited from me, me mum and me nan and my great grandfather. So yeah, sessions were great. I mean, I used to they, they used to come in. Joe Meek used to be like uh, they used to sort of roll them inside of this next. Usually, like if, if they got a pretty face. Uh, they couldn't sing, you know. So if someone had come in a bit ugly, you think, "Oh, great, he's got a good singer." <laughs> and I, I was right every time. Uh, but he used to do the demo. The, the general um, way that Joe used to do it, he would play me. He'd say, "Well, okay, we can do this song." He'd play me this demo that he'd written. But his way of writing it and his way of uh, putting it over to me was he would pick, he would think of a tune or he'd, he'd compose a tune in his head. Um, he would find any record as long as it was the same tempo. It could be a, a Buddy Holly record, could be a, a Little Richard record or whatever, and sing his tune over it. <laughs> now, not only was that hard enough to decipher, he also sang terribly out of tune and would put loads of echo on. <laughs> Then I had to decipher what he was what on. What he about. meant? Yeah. So he couldn't write it down. No, and he no, couldn't no, compose no. it. I was just sit there with a, you know, on the back of a fag packet and like go, well, that's a C, that's an F and a G, and come into the boys and say, okay, like this, there we are. Uh, let's, let's, uh, we'll have an intro, two, four bar intro, and then we'll, we'll do two verses, middle eight, verse, solo, and out, you know. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. And, uh, I mean, Richie Blackmore says to this day, I've seen him doing interviews, he said, I don't know how Chaz did it. He said, I'd, I, I, if it was left to me, I, I just would have st stared blank. <laughs> but I, I could figure out quite oh, closely what Joe Meek was on about. I was good at that. I thought, well, so you had the temperament for studio work as well. You could get along with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed the, the, uh, the, the studio work uh, all, all my life I mean sometimes it, uh, later on it, it got a bit too much but the, the odd studio uh, uh, session was great Right. were you surprised to see Richard Blackmore go on to what he went on to um, not, not really no because he, he stood out I mean when, uh, when we got hold of uh, Richie uh, we We'd, we'd started to get a, a bit of a tickle in the charts and we'd got gigs. We'd got a good, you know, good good act on the road. Uh, so we had pretty much the choice of any uh, guitar player going because, you know, we, we was a good band and we was earning money. So, you know, what more could you want? Uh, so we, we actually did Nick Richie. He was the best around. We seen him with such. And I remember me and the guitar player talking, so who should we get? You know, we felt we could get anybody. So let's get that bloke we saw with such. So I always remember he came down to, to uh, Joe Meek said, I'll get him down in the studio. And he came down. And it just so happened after, because he had an offer of another band. Mitch, Richie told us this later. But it just so happened when he came down, uh, at the end of the session, a guitar player, a, a ribbon guitar said, oh, we'll get some royalties coming through, boys. That's 100 quid between about whatever it was, 25 quid each. And Richie said after, he said, that's what impressed me. He said, no, and it was a good band. Like, also got royalties as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, we could have, we could have, we could have planned that, couldn't we? Yeah, <laughs> we said, look, let's do this. But it was genuine. Right. Anyway, Richie joined us and um, he was with us. Uh, we went on the uh, Jerry Lee Lewis tour, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, then, then on the road with Gene Vincent. So tell us about backing those guys. What was it like? You know, they, do, did they just turn up and expect you to know the tunes, or was the yeah was I mean, the rehearsal in the conventional sense? Or that was Jerry Lee's uh, way. There again, Richie, Richie, uh, I've seen right up. So I didn't realise he did it on on the day that we were to back Jerry Lee. Now I'd seen Jerry Lee Lewis in 1958. Uh, when I was in a skiffle group, and that's when I thought I've got to learn to play the piano. So I was hooked on Jerry Lee from then. And only 63, which was five years later, uh, seemed a hell of a long time between then. I mean, now five years don't seem no. like, like no. that. Um, but we got this, we'd seen an advert that uh, Gene Vincent needed a backing group, uh, and it was from Don Arden, and uh, it was Sharon Osborne's dad. Went down, oh, he came down to see us at a uh, rehearsal hall and he liked us and he said, right, he said, I've got this tour coming up. He said, you got the choice. He said, either back uh, Jerry Lee or, or, no, either back Gene Vincent or Jerry Lee. So, hang on, let's have Jerry Lee. 
So I went on tour with Jerry Lee, and it was great. Uh, as I say, uh, uh, Richard remembers on the way up to uh, uh, with meeting him up at Birmingham Town Hall on the first night. He said, you were telling me all the keys. Oh, Jerry Lee So does. the first night was the first time you were going to meet him? Yeah, yeah. For, the day of the with, show? Yeah, and play with him, yeah. But I knew him inside out anyway. I, knew, I had all his records. So I said, right, Breathless is in F. A whole lot of shaking's in C. And so, you know. But we so went there wouldn't to, be rehearsal in the normal sense? No, we went up there. We had about half a song rehearsal, really. <laughs> and he just went, that's OK, boys. Well, there you go. But I, I love that way of working, and I'm pretty quick at picking out balls. Remember, because he brought his own own drummer over with him, who was great, Morris Durant. And um, I remember our drummer, Mickey Underwood, he said, oh, he said, I hate to back Jerry Lee. So I said, why? He said, you never know what he's going to do. And I said, that's exactly why I love backing him. I'm ready for him. You go, what's he going to do? Shake my nerves and you're out. I'm there, you know, see, bang, what way you go. Because a little bit of it, he's trying to catch you out a little bit. There's yeah. A, and get, it, there's a game to keep himself yeah, yeah. amused. Right. And it, it's, it, he expects you to, to be there. Uh, and he knew, I mean, he's quoted me as his favourite bass player. His guitar, guitar player told me that years later. Uh, but, yeah, I'd, I just just love been in a band like that right. I, I don't I don't like rehearsing to this day right. I don't um, if we're going to rehearse we'll we'll run through something at a sound check and just get the rough edges uh, right and then bang straight in the deep right, end on right, the night right. you know just so what led from so that you you ended up in Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers yeah tell us about that so when's this 65 66 something like that this was uh, we were touring after Jerry Lee went home we that was the beginning of 63 I was really fed up, you know, Jerry Lee's gone home there again, what, what am I going to do now? And it was, seemed almost like, well, I think it was almost immediately, Don Arden called us in his office, and he said, oh, I really enjoyed your playing on the tour. He said, I've got someone else on me books who needs a, a band. And I remember thinking, oh, I'd, I'd sort of forgotten that Gene Vincent was still there. I thought I was going to be one of them dodgy uh, blokes that always thinks he's Elvis, like most of them did. Gene Vincent, fantastic. So we went straight back on the road with Gene Vincent and we was with him for about a year from the... Oh, really? Right the way through 60, to, the end, uh, to the end of 63 and in, yeah. in the beginning of 64. But in amongst that time, I know it was in the November of 1963, we went to uh, Star Club Hamburg. Uh, Which and, is where the Beatles had been and cut their teeth and yeah, so on. Yeah, it was a great place, to Hamburg. Um, uh, in England... And I got the feeling, well, it was a fact that rock and roll has, has finished. Everybody was saying, oh, rock and roll's finished. This is like 1961, 62. Well, they didn't call it rock and roll anymore, did they? No, it was very no. old fashioned to call it rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. Point. And it was like, that's, that was then, and yeah. this is now, it's all ballads. And I thought, well, I still like rock and roll, and we still played rock and roll. Am I old fashioned? But I don't care. But in, uh, in Hamburg, the rock and roll scene was as big as ever it was, and they had all the big artists over there at the Star Club, Ray Charles, Fats Domino, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, we went over there with Jerry Lee, uh, Gene Vincent, and at the time we went over there with Gene Vincent, um, on the same bill was Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers, who was, at the time, my favourite English band. Because they were a bit uh, funky, weren't they, Cliff Yeah. Bennett? They had a horn section. Which yeah, nobody else really did at the time. No, they, they, it, 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 he sort of started it off really because later on in the sixties there were a good, there were quite a few bands like Ronnie Jones and the Night Timers and Zoot Money and yeah, uh, Graham Bond yeah. that, that got like the, the Hammond organ and the saxophones and playing these. Stuff. That was a great period, but that was a bit later. But yeah, I came home from um, Hamburg uh, with uh, Gene, and it weren't long after that. I think it was. Uh, a month or so later that uh, he went back home and it seemed like almost days uh, that I got a phone call from Cliff Bennett and he said um, he said our bass player's leaving he's going to join the Rocking Berries and he said uh, I saw you over in Hamburg and he said I want a, a, a bass player who sings he said I like your singing I'm going to do this one Chuck Berry one and he said you want the job I went, yeah, I think so. So I went down and then auditioned with him, and uh, I was straight in uh, the Rebel Rouse. Now you toured with the Beatles. Yeah, that was uh, so. I joined the Rebel Rousers um, around '65. Uh, I was in '66 
because we were with the same agent as the Beatles, Nims, Brian Epstein, and um, we were going over, the Beatles were doing, going to do their last European tour in Germany, and uh, they, they asked for us to be on the, uh, to support them. So we went over there, and that was great there again. The Beatles got full, uh, full of praise for them um, in the early days. I'd been uh, amongst so-called stars. They, they all sort of uh, act like we better not talk to the musicians. and Beatles were great. They were just like kids just started. You know, and I remember... Um, uh, coming home on a plane with them, and uh, they, they just had um, Yellow Sub. No, the Yellow Submarine was going to be released. Well, on the album, on their new album. So this is pre Revolver. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. We, we they played it to us in their dressing room in uh, in Hamburg. Well, they played you the, what the acetate. The acetate yeah, and uh, so you heard Revolver before it was Revolver. Yeah, yeah. I remember that was all in there. It, uh, yeah, I'll go back to them before we. On the way home, um, we were in the middle of the tour, and Paul McCartney, or this roadie come in, Mal Evans, said, "All oh, the boys want to see you in the dressing room." He said, "I want to play you something." So we went in there, and uh, Epstein was in there at the time, and all the Beatles, John Lennon and the Ringo and George, and a little record player in the corner, and they put it on. And uh, Paul said, "He said there's a song on here that'd be great for you boys." He said, "But I'm going to play you the whole album," and he played it, and. Um, I remember Paul McCartney was sitting from about it, me and you away, yeah, like about yeah. a yard away. And when he got to Yellow Submarine, he stared me just right in the eyes all the way through it. Now, I'm listening to <laughs> In the Town Where I Was Born, <laughs> Lived a Man, Who Sailed the Sea. What, am I supposed to laugh or not? You know what I mean? And so I, I think I just stared him back all the way through. Yeah, because he was looking for your reaction. Yeah, he was, yeah. And I didn't give any reaction. I thought, I don't know if I'm supposed to laugh at this point or what. I'm but you, you can't, it's amazing, isn't it? Because you can't imagine a time when those things weren't so familiar exactly. to everybody. Yeah. Whereas yeah. a week before, yeah. there were only 30 people in the world who heard them, yeah, probably. Exactly. Yeah. And you were one of them. Yeah, yeah. So the song that, that Cliff Bennett was going to be given from that was Got to Get You Into yeah. My Life. Yeah, yeah, got to was, that one. Which was quite a big hit, wasn't it? Yeah, he t- when we went back home, um, Paul took us into Abbey Road. And he produced it. He played a little bit of piano in, it in the middle, just a little sweep down to either a little dust spot. Uh, but yeah, he done. He, I learnt so much just in that one one session off of uh, Paul because he was he'd been working, not producing, and because I remember doing the track and um, uh, listening to the playback, and I weren't mad on the bass sound; it was a bit sort of ploddy. I was playing it all right, but I didn't like the sound of it. And I, I, but I thought, well, it's done now. And um, Paul said, "What do you think of the bass sound?" He said, "It's a bit like Joe Loss, isn't it?" I went, "Yeah." He said, "I ain't really mad on it." He said, "Oh, we can do something about that." And I thought it's already been recorded. I didn't realise you could you EQ could it back. through yeah, the desk. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought it has a bit of magic, like I learned early off Joe Meek about editing. That's another story. Right. But just watching people. When you think, hey, that's magic. He said, and he messed about. He put it through here and EQ it up a bit because I think it was only a four track uh, recorder. It, it would then. be, wouldn't it? Yeah. And they just bounce down onto one yeah. track, wouldn't they? Yeah. Keep- Keep re-recording, but he he EQ'd the bass and it sounded great in the end. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so yeah. yeah, and it came out. I could think I got to about number six in uh, 1966. Let's just, let's just move forward to um, a group that probably and many people don't know that you were involved in. We're doing a, a great overlooked British group, Head, Hands and Feet. Yeah, yeah. Which you joined what 68, 69, something like that. Yeah, that ninety beginning. Yeah, end of nineteen sixty nine. I joined them. Uh, the Rebel Rousers. We split from Cliff Bennett, and we started doing the clubs. But that was sort of petering out a bit, and uh, people were leaving, and so the band band was sort of floundering a bit. But uh, in the meantime, I'd, I'd uh, become pals with Albert Lee. We used to do sessions together. I rode him in on doing a few sessions, and uh, there used to be a good sort of country rock scene around Hammersmith that uh, pubs around there. <laughs> you don't think of that normally do you? yeah no that's right but it was, it was, it was quite around <laughs> even Hammersmith. in those days there was a yeah, yeah really? was the, there was the Red Cow there was oh, the Clarendon right, okay. there was uh, 
about five or six pubs that had a like probably a, the Nashville, it, I suppose, was the Nashville yeah, Nashville, Nashville rooms, Nashville, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, and anyway, uh, we used to go around there, sit in. If I had a night off, you know, I'd, I'd meet Albert around there. So we become mates, and we liked each other's playing. Uh, and then I got a phone call from Albert one day. He said, I mean, this band's going to form. He said, uh, it was called Poet and a One Man Band then. Yes, yeah. He said, uh, it was um, uh, Pat Donaldson was yeah, the original yeah. bass player, but he don't want to join, so they're trying to get him. He said, and I've suggested, you know, getting you to fancy it. He said, come down, have a blow and see what happens. So I did, and, uh, yeah, the next minute I, I was in the, in the band with... Uh, with Albert and the rest of them. And, uh, so who else is in Has Hands and Feet? Tony Colton? Yeah, Tony Colton was a singer. Ray Smith, uh, guitar. Well, they were the two main writers, Colton right. and Ray Smith. Pete Gavin on the drums, who's a great drummer. Albert Lee, guitar player. Me on the bass. And at the very beginning, there was Mike O'Neill, who played keyboards, but uh, he left after about three or four months. So they made three albums, I think yeah. I'm right saying. Yeah, On Island. That's right, you got, got it. very well reviewed and so forth, yeah, didn't yeah, they? But yeah. it didn't really sell, didn't take off. No, they still keep getting played, and yes. warming up the band was, uh, uh, you know, we th- I'd, I've heard it since, and it's a great single. It really rocks along, and it's like one of those things that should have been hit, yeah, and yeah. it wasn't. It was released, it got all the plugs, uh, and it was even re-released uh, a couple of years later, but it never did anything. It just happens like that, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. But it's, it, honestly, if anybody fancies themselves as into Americana and Flying Burrito Brothers and so forth, go and find those albums. Yeah, they still sound good. They're terrific yeah, albums. They yeah. really stand up very, very well. Yeah. So that then took you into the world of John Peel sessions and, you know, yeah. rock festivals, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Were you doing all those? Yeah, which I, did, I weren't mad on at the time because <laughs> they were so, so disorganised. They were just a mess. I mean, like, I can remember one particular one. It was Wheelie Festival. <laughs> and Ry Kuda was on at the time, and he was great. I still love him to this day. And... Um, but the the stage that we were on, it it, it started uh, started raining. I mean, there was no cover on the stage or anything. It was just like open to the elements. So electrics yeah. and rain. And I remember it started pouring down the rain. I'm shouting to the road. It's like rain going into my bass amp. I'm shouting to the road, get on, put something over. And he's come on like and put some a bit of plastic bag over the top of my amp and run off because it's raining. He didn't want to get wet. <laughs> and like the amp's just flapping about. And I always remember Tony Cole, and he's running about singing, sliding all over the stage and trying to get the crowd going. <laughs> and it was just a complete mess. And I thought, apart from that, I don't think we're going to get off this stage alive. We're all going to get, we're all going to get electrocuted any minute now. You know, it was, it's absolutely teaming there. He did loads of sessions during the 70s. Yeah. Well, one particular one uh, for Labby Sifri resurfaced quite recently on a huge Eminem record tell us about that yeah that was uh, one of the sessions that me and Dave did because when me and Dave got together uh, I rode Dave in on the bass on all the sessions that I was doing I was playing the piano or guitar double on guitar and one of the sessions we was doing Big Jim Sullivan uh, was producing the session who he with Derek Lawrence ran me and Dave's record company at the time so we got in on the session so Labby Sifri was on the same label we did this session, an album with Labby, and uh, there was a track on it we found out later that Eminem had sampled called I Got The. But he sampled, there was um, a riff that Big Jim Sullivan arranged. Now, that he was great at arranging riffs, and I, looking back on it, they never quite fitted the tune. That, but... They're so obviously there to to be nicked off and put onto another track, <laughs> and that's what he obviously did. We well, did do, um, but Big Jim. I mean, we were me and Dave. I think I was playing a guitar on it on that track, uh, and it was just a riff, and we were just playing what we were told. You know, it wasn't in, wasn't my idea or Dave's idea. It was Big Jim's idea. So if anybody should have got paid for it, and I've found out he hasn't got any money for it, Jim. In fact, I'm seeing him uh, next week. Um, it should have been Jim, Sull- Big Jim Sullivan, because it was his idea. But don't you think it's amazing, though, that you can do a session like that for a, a track that completely passes without any notice, then 30 years yeah. later, yeah. in a form of music that would have been inconceivable at the time yeah. that you did it, 
this thing just turns up. Yes. Yeah. Is so you know what was it? it was what my name is was the was the the track that, yeah. that this uh, ended up on. It is and strange. Does everybody then on the session end up ringing up each other saying, "Do you remember that session we did in 1965?" <laughs> well, I, I first found out about it is my son who plays drums for me now. He came in. He said, "Dad," he said, uh, "Have you heard of uh, Eminem?" I went, "No." He said, "He said he's, he's got a massive, massive hit record all around the world." And he said that the main part on it is that something is sampled off something that you did on a session. Like, hey, <laughs> we talking about? And uh, yeah, he discovered it first, so that's how that came about. Right, right, right. But you didn't get a big payday from it. No. Nor did Big Jim Sullivan. No, nor did Jim. I think Labby did, uh, but Jim should have got it really right. because it was his idea. He said, "Okay," but he he was a master at doing that. Jim, he would do these things. It's almost as if uh, it was meant to be, because there's other records that Jim's done it. He'd do a great riff and a great bass. He'd say, you play this piano bit and you play this and I'll play this. And it was all really worked out, but it didn't fit the song. But we, it went on the song anyway. Because that was his idea for that week. Yeah, and, and it, <laughs> but it was a fantastic bit. So it was, it was made, it really stood out and... That's obviously what Eminem heard when well, he probably heard the song and thought, that's nothing. Then suddenly this great riff comes but the, out. But that's the, that's thing. To be that's the thing, isn't it? That's what session men provide, isn't it? Bits. Yeah, yeah. And very often they're the bits that yeah. make people buy the record. Yeah, yeah. The odd little things. Yeah, you know and that's mean? what his game was, uh, the Big Jim. He yeah, was yeah. on the road. Uh, as I said, he was the first, uh, one of the first sessions I ever did. But he was like my hero in the early days. He was the sort of rock and English rock and roll guitar mm -hmm. player, you know, there weren't many around. So talking about English rock and roll brings us to Chaz and Dave. Yeah. For which you're probably best known. You know, so I look up press clippings and it's 80s pop stars Chaz and Dave. And I'm thinking 80s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 90s, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But you're just, you're kind of saddled with that. Aren't yeah, you? yeah. Have I mean, yeah. you completely come to terms with that? You know? Well, it, it, you know, people put... <laughs> Slap things on your pigeonhole you and say you this and say you that. I mean, came out. we I've been around for years and uh, David done his bit and then we've got together and and done what we want to do. Basically, Cockney rock and roll. And you get this like all oh, nov these novelty boys. And a lot of people thought we'd just been discovered in the pub. We used to do interviews and they say, "When you really um, pleased that you you know you just pub musicians and so." I went. But I've done a little bit before that. <laughs> Is it really like, you together? Did yeah, yeah. People oh, thought yeah. you just, they'd found you in the park. Yeah, and they're like, you know, you must have been over the moon when they got hold of you and I like, sort of made you pop stars. I mean, well, yeah, you know. But it took a while. It's sort of gone a full circle, really, because all the way through that period, um, old Chaz and Dale, they're a bit novelty, aren't they? And it's sort of... And I used to get interviews later on and say, doesn't it annoy you when they say that, you know, people that do know what I've done? I said, no, it doesn't annoy me... Because if anybody thinks that's uh, a novelty piano solo, I think, well, they haven't got it. I look down on them. They can't, they can't feel it. It's only if people that I admire didn't like it. Like if Jerry Lee said he didn't like it, then that would, that would worry me. Right, you know? right, but right. If anybody's going, oh, Chas and Dave, no, I don't like them, I think, well, they haven't got any heart. Yeah, sure. Simple as that. So what, what were the songs you started off writing with Chas and Dave? What, what, what were the first ones? What were the kind of breakthrough ones? Um, I'll do one if you Go want. Go on. See if I remember it. Get your shoes on. You better get a move on. Don't let nobody change your mind. Whoa, you better get your shoes on. Yeah, you better get a move on. But you better leave what's mine Something like that Right Little sort of country sort of rock We were feeling our way really And then you started You're hitting the kind of Cockney seam Of doing things more In the kind of North London vernacular <coughs> Yeah I mean my And I thought of the idea When I was with Ed Zanz of Feet In America I'd just sing uh, Country stuff uh, and, you know, great. Um, but when I went to America and I, and I was still singing in an American accent, it felt... I felt a fraud in America. I thought, well, you know, I'm, I've got to be myself now. I'm not trying to force it on anybody, but I should now become myself. Say, 
hey, where'd you come from? You know, you, you, oh, you're English, I can hear that by the way you're singing. And I thought, they can't hear that by the way I'm singing because I'm singing American. So that's where I initially tried a few things out in America. And that's when I came back home and uh, I'd had this idea and about me going on the piano and writing songs about things that I know about and singing in my own accent. And I rang up Dave and I uh, said, let's go down the pub for a pint, I've got an idea. We did, and Dave weren't quite sure about it. I said, how about me and you getting together uh, with this idea that I've got of uh, writing songs about things that I know and singing in my own accent. Um, he weren't quite sure at first, but we... We we got together and it began to work and that was the start of Chaz and Dave and it just developed from there. I mean, one of my main ambitions was to write a serious song singing in my own accent, uh, a song that ain't. I, I love funny song, Gertrude's you know comical song, Rabbit. But I thought uh, uh, this is before I ever wrote one. I thought why do, why does people ever always laugh when you sing in a Cockney accent? You know, it can do you know, Harry Champion. I love it. Yeah. So um, ain't no pleasing you was uh, a particular one that I wrote with Dave's approval that that did that. People listen to it and they go, yeah, I like that song. So uh, right. I'll do it for you. If go you on, want. yeah. Do it. Build my life around you, did what I thought. Never cared about me, and I've seen the light, oh darling. Ain't no pleasing you. You seem to think that everything I ever did was wrong. I should have known it all along, bad darling. by Fraser's band at a wedding rather unfittingly at uh, some at point. Late in Orient. Uh, Even less fittingly. <laughs> <laughs> so Chaz and Dave, the idea, you know, the picture we've always got is in a pub kind of thing. But mm. as Chaz and Dave, you played in all sorts of places, didn't you? You played at Nebworth, didn't you? The, the yeah, Zeppelin, in the early days, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, when we just had Goethe in the charts, we, we supported Led Zeppelin at uh, Nebworth to... to uh, Two weeks running, yeah. Was that because that, that that their personal request or? <laughs> um, well, yeah. I mean, a lot of musicians. That that's the sort of funny thing. Is like in the early days, uh, the average sort of punter didn't really get us. But then I looked down upon them. Uh, but people like Eric Clapton were big. You know, we toured with Eric, supported Eric Clapton, and all the musicians loved Chaz and Dave. And uh, yeah. Led Zeppelin loved Chaz and Dave and got us on to do uh, to support them at Nebworth. Right. And, uh, yeah, it was great. Right. It was good. But then and you did the commercials, the Courage. Yeah. So, so what happened with those? Were they coming to you and saying, can you write a song for, the, for this campaign? It, or? it came the other way around. We were doing, uh, amongst uh, all the pubs that we were doing to pay the rent, we, we just started recording, me and Dave, uh, but we still was going out doing the pubs and clubs 
and uh, there was a pub we used to do the Oxford Arms around uh, around the East End. Uh, and I remember being in it, it used to be packed out, it's been a great night. I've uh, been in there one night, and this bloke came up after and he said, Could we be doing Gertrude? We used to write a song and then try them out in the evening, you know, just see how to feel them out. He said, I like that song, good. He said, Do you write that one? Said, yeah. He said, I belong to a, an ad agency, I'd love to use it for for a, a beer ad. And we went, Yeah, all right, mate. He's you know, got a phone number, he'd like you do, yeah. write it down, think no more of it. Loads of people are going to. But lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, um, he did get in touch with the, the office and they called us in. And um, we did uh, some two or three. We, we did Gertrude, uh, Strumming and a couple. Anyway, Gertrude was the one that the, the company Courage Beer come up with. And when we finally got on the, the session, in those days, and it probably is the same there, because we used to have a stopwatch, it, yeah, it would have to be 28 and a half seconds long. Oh, 29 really? was too long, 28 was too oh, short. Really? 28 and a half seconds long. <laughs> and we used to do Gertrude was like, Gertrude, when a kid, a swing it on a gun. Gertrude, when a paper boy's of an alley. That was how it was, quite a lot of funky yeah, yeah, little yeah, version, yeah, yeah. you know. So, of course, we've done it, done it like that, and, like, it's time, it's gone. Plus, gone 45 seconds, you know, it's <laughs> too is. long. So, I do a bit fast. Gucci, when it gets a swing, finally we got Gucci, when it gets a swing on again. And it actually sounded better for it. I thought that's a bit more lively. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we yeah. got down to the 28 and a half seconds. Right. And uh, the ad came out and started getting some plays. And um, our manager called, he said, Here, my, I want to put out Gucci from the album. And I said, he can't do that. I said, it's nothing like the... Because it was like really rock and roll. Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, it's, I said it's, not, it's like a different tune. He said, well, they want to put it out. And I remember he said, Dave, what do you think? Well, I don't know. I said, no, we can't do that. And we were on the road. We were doing a tour. He said, well, when can you do it? I said, any time. He said, you say it. He said, well, they've got a day off tomorrow. Do it tomorrow. I said, yeah, OK. Book a studio tomorrow. He said, where do you want to go? I said, don't care where. Anywhere. We do it tomorrow, and he booked um, Portland Place Studios the next day. We went in and we re-recorded it at the right tempo, a fast tempo. Wrote and finished the B side that David started, uh, banging in your head. And I remember leaving the old seven and a half inch IPS tape box with chalking on the front for our manager. I still remember now. I was so convinced. Here it is. See you on top of the pops. And I just, was, you know. And I remember he rang up next day, played it. He went, oh, it's fantastic, it's great. And we you were it. on top of the pops. Yeah, we did. Many yeah. times, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but we recorded A-side, wrote the B-side, did it all in one day. Right, and, right. and off we went to another gig. <laughs> but there were, there were other hits associated with that campaign, were there? The beer in the sideboard? Yeah, once, we, once <laughs> they'd done that, it was so effective for them. And the producer of, of those ads, uh, John Webster. John Webster's name was dead now. Uh, he said, what else songs have you got? He said, can I just, you know... So we used to, every time we'd, we'd, we had an album out, we'd just give them all to him. Right. And he'd pick one out and they'd sort of rearrange it a little bit word-wise. Uh, Margate was one of them. Uh, oh, yes, of course, right. Yeah, was, uh, so you must have done very well out of those things. Yeah, yeah, right. they, were, they were great because they were like little videos for us. We only changed them a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but they were shot around our songs rather than us writing a song especially for them. Right, right. So uh, it was it was great for us. So coming up today, Chaz and Dave, it, it, Dave's kind of retired, is that fair yeah, enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you, so, so you continue on your own? Chaz and his band, yeah, I've got my son on drums now. Mickey Burt sadly retired a couple of years ago. He's uh, not very well, but he's all right, he's ticking over. Uh, but he couldn't play anymore, he decided to retire. So I've got my son on drums, got Darren Juniper plays bass, and just coincidence, his dad, Brian Juniper, was in a skiffle group with me at school, and it was his dad who introduced me to Dave many years ago, so it's all like very much in the family. Right. But yeah, Dave does, he still does the odd one, but in general, he's retired. Um, but the, uh, there's no sign of you retiring? No, no, no. I, I love gigging too much. I, I realise if I don't do at least one gig a week. I've, I really do feel like something's missing. You get you get bad tempered, do you? A lot of musicians do this. Not bad tempered, <laughs> but like like I've 
missed a day's food or, or, or a night's sleep or something. I'm, I've, I feel that ain't, the week ain't fulfilled yeah, yeah, if I don't do a gig. Which Once is extraordinary when you consider this the thing you started doing when you were like 12, 13 or yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's it, a key I mean, part of your life. I knew then, like I started off saying when I did my first skiffle uh, 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 session, a uh, group, uh, show and they give me 10 bob at the end of most fantastic night I thought this is the life for me and so I was right then right and I, st- I still am there and I, I, I don't feel right if I ain't and I feel it, it makes the next day as well even if I'm not gigging the next day if I've done a good, good gig the night before the next day is like I wake up and think hey that was a great gig last night and it's just uh, good good yeah. brilliant Chas before you go just before we wind up we've got, I've got to get you to tell us the story about how you were nearly in the reformed Beatles oh yeah yeah well um, I know uh, I, uh, Paul McCartney's a big fan anyway but uh, I did a um, well I'll tell you about the session after yeah, it started we would me and Dave were invited um to Eric Clapton's wedding. Uh nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty I think it was. And uh it, it was at Eric's house. He'd had a marquee set up in his back garden and the stage. And he'd done the right thing, that's what they should have had at, at uh, Jim uh Jim Marshall's uh tribute like just amplifiers and keyboard yeah, yeah. and guitar and a bass there just sitting there so people could pick it up or whatever weren't like under obligation or nothing but it should be there that's what was at eric's um party and um we were just milling about having a beer and jawing and all the little kids like all the sons and daughters of the people around one of them got get dark up on the drums and uh, messing about and he recognized me off the telly you're Chaz, aren't you? You do Gertrude, don't you? I went, yeah. He said, can you do it on that piano? So I just got up and started doing it. Gertrude and this little kid there. So our kids can do something else. And I started, had my head down, I started doing a bit of rock and roll. And um, I was doing a Chuck Berry, round in this letter, going to man to do my local DJ, you know, just me head down. And I, all beside me, just uh, heard some drums started up. And I looked up and it was Ringo I'd got on the drums. And I knew Ringo, I'd done a few sessions with him anyway. I was, a wing. I was just carrying on playing. Next minute I've heard a bass started up. And I looked up and his Paul was on the bass. <laughs> and I'm carrying on rocking and rolling. <laughs> Next minute I've looked up, George is plugging his guitar in. <laughs> so I'm rocking away. He's little, don't move. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, hey, I'm, I'm the fourth beater. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, no, it must have been after 1980 because uh, John died, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, in yeah sure. So yeah. about 81, because I know John was dead then. And, uh, of course, it was great. We continued playing, and I remember doing the Paul McCartney. Uh, Jojo is a man who thought he was a lot. Do that one, do that one. <laughs> well, OK, so he done it. And uh, we had a good, like, half an hour, three quarter of an hour session. And um, Ringo's wife, Maureen, she's, she's dead now, uh, she was taking loads and loads of pictures and she was friendly with my wife. They got on all right together. And uh, she said, uh, oh, I'll send you all these pictures tomorrow. Like, you know, so um, I should give her a dress. Anyway, by the time I come off stage, I mean, me, what, uh, Maureen came over and said, oh, I've just been told I mustn't. I mustn't give any of these pictures out, you know. So they were around somewhere, oh, chasing the people. Oh, that's sad. Somebody's got them, haven't they? Because in because it wouldn't happen nowadays. Because it would have been full of mobile phones, and everybody would have we'd have all seen pictures you're as it right. was happening, wouldn't right. we? Yeah. Wouldn't even yeah. have the have to have you tell us the story. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Chaz, thank you very much indeed for coming. You're in. welcome. It's, you're welcome. It's been it, it's yeah. been a delight. Yeah. And you're you're playing this weekend. You're playing at the Half Moon on Friday night. Yeah. In Putney, uh, but you're doing various markets over the yeah over uh, market Sunday. Um, somewhere else in Spitalfields on Saturday. All right. Well, if, if you're around about in London yeah. over the Jubilee weekend, uh, you know, make a date with Chaz. All right. Thanks very much. Cheers. You're welcome. Enjoyed it. If you've been affected by any of the issues in this podcast, go to wordmagazine.co.uk or apply at your newsagent every month.